Will you turn your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 9? Luke chapter 9, I'm going to read from verse 23 to 27. I want to a term, uh, I want to call the sermon His Terms, His Terms of Discipleship. Uh, this was intended to be a two week uh, session, a series, uh, but I must ask your apology for not being able to make it next Sunday. We, I need to be back at the church and uh, really thankful to the elders for letting me uh, cancel at short notice. But really what it was is the two parts to discipleship that Jesus would call uh, Peter, uh, Andrew, John and James, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So this week we wanted to, wanted to see what are his terms of discipleship and then to ask the question, uh, it's your turn, how do we make fishers of men? But today we want to see the first part of that. And before I read the passage, I want us to watch a video. So I'm going to ask for the video to come on. take up his cross daily and follow me for whoever would save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words of him will the son of man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the father and of the holy angels but I tell you truly there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. This is God's word. Let's just pray. Father, we pray that you will speak to us, Lord. We are desperate. We are hungry. That you would feed us, Lord. That we would be fed with your word as we face this world. Help us, Lord, not to be just hearers, but doers of your word. This we pray in your name and for your glory. Amen. I'm not sure if I caught this, but Jesus divides the group into two groups in this passage. The first group are the ones who deny themselves for the sake of His name and for His glory and His word. And then there are others who deny Christ for themselves. Those are the two groups and I think the question we have to ask ourselves honestly, no, no games to be played. 
honestly, which of these two groups we are in? Do we deny Christ for ourselves, for our, for our glory, or do we deny ourselves for Christ's name, for His word? We need to ask ourselves this honest question. And so, really, what I want to do today is to elaborate on that question by explaining, understanding what that question is. If that question is important, then it's important that we understand the question. It's important that we answer the question right and then know what the terms are. So that's what we want to do this, this, uh, this time that we have with us. What's important is that this passage that we just read, it appears in the same context in all of the Synoptic Gospels, in Matthew, and Mark, and in Luke, it's the same context. The context is this, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people think, or who did they say I am? And they say, some of them say you are John the Baptist who's come back to life, and some say you're Jeremiah, and some say you're one of the prophets. And then he turns and asks his disciple, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ of God. And you know what the Lord says? The Lord says, blessed art thou Simon, son of Jonas, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Did you, did you catch that? What did the others say? The others said he was a prophet, he was Jeremiah, he was John the Baptist, but they could not confess that he was Jesus Christ. The confession by Peter was a revelation of the Father. And so the question that Jesus asks about who we think he is, whether we think that he is Christ, is I believe the most important question that will ever be asked. Because the answer that you will give will decide which of these two terms, which of these two groups you are in. And if we believe that we, are, that we believe that He is Christ, then we must also ask ourselves this question, what are His terms? If He is Christ, then He must have His terms. We cannot come and dictate our terms to Him. What are His terms to be a disciple? You see, when, um, when Peter uh, confessed that, it goes on to say that Jesus started to explain how the Son of Man will be delivered up and how he will be um, uh, crucified, how he will be killed. And what does Peter do? Peter starts to rebuke him. It's a, it's a lot. We, we, we just said you're the Messiah. You need to speak some messianic words. You can't be talking about things like this. And the Lord rebukes him. And calls him the sin. See, five verses before, he had the revelation of the Father. And yet in 0 to 5, he's not called the Satan. And so mere revelation of the Father is not enough. And, and then he goes on to say, both to the disciples and to his hearers, what are his terms of discipleship? And I said this is the most important question. I, you know, I'm not sure if you knew, but in Islam they have what's called the doctrine of the shirk. The doctrine of the shirk is that if you, if you call a God a triune God, if you say that God has a son, or if you say that Jesus is the Christ, it's an unpardonable sin. And there, right there, it divides the camp into two, doesn't it? Because if you, if, if they say, the world would say that if you say Jesus is Christ, it's an unpardonable sin. And we are saying, according to the Bible, that if we don't confess Jesus as Christ, we will die in our sins unpardoned. A very, very important question. And so we need to understand what is terms and he says if anyone would come after me let him deny himself take up the cross and follow him make no mistake you see his his hearers would have recoiled it was just like what, what was that just a few years prior judas had uh, raised up an insurrection about 2000 people were crucified on the way leading up to jerusalem 
They knew exactly what Jesus was saying. When, when Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me, they knew what that meant. They knew it was death. Jesus was calling to follow them to death. Those are the words that the Roman soldier would use. A Roman soldier would go up to a Jew and says, come take up your cross and follow me. He knows that was a death march. It's the cross that he is carrying on which he will be crucified. Invitation to come and die. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, Cost of Disciple, Discipleship, he writes, When Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. He bids him to come and die. I look at this and I say, this is like an active de-recruiting process on the part of the Lord. We sometimes think that the Lord, God must be desperate for people to come to him. And you read this passage and he's trying to make it so clear. I, I, I sometimes think that um, Jesus did not read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence Jews. He is pulling no punch. And so the question I uh, want to reiterate again and again. How in our life, in our choices, have we shown him to be Christ of our lives? And so what I want to do is I want to take that, that uh, verse that we read and divide that into four parts and ask those specific questions. So we will look at what, what the word cross means. We will look at what the word disciple means. We will look at the word Jesus as Lord and Master. And then we will see what does it mean to deny yourselves. So there's some clarity on what it is. So first we'll look at what is, what is the cross. What did Jesus mean when he said the cross? Uh, to understand that, I think it's important that we ask ourselves this question. What cross is not? What it is not, right? It's, it's not about wearing the cross on, on your neck or uh, carrying a physical cross with you as you go to the office, as you come to the church. I'm telling you, if, if that were it, my cross would have been the biggest cross. I would have gleamed it, polished it, I would have brought it. But that was not what Jesus was saying. We know that. But sometimes we think cross is a difficulty. It's a truant teenager. Or it is an irresponsible spouse. Or you might say that, oh, this is a cross for me because I'm, I'm suffering. I've got some sickness or whatever. And Jesus is saying, no, that is not what it is. At best, that could be a thorn because that's what Paul says, right? Paul says, the, the messenger of Satan to buffet me a thorn in the flesh. That's not a cross. A cross is an instrument of death. Nothing sharp. On which your old nature, your flesh must be crucified. Period. It's an instrument of death. Let me read to you a quote by C.A. Coates. It says, The cross is not some physical infirmity or mental anguish. These things are common to all men. The cross is a pathway that is deliberately chosen. It's a path which so far as this world goes is one of dishonor and Reproach. And Jesus clarifies this. He doesn't stop there saying that, okay, take up your cross, but he goes on to clarify in your translations, depending most of the translations, I know KJV and ESV do, verse 24, 25, and 26, each start with the word for. For whoever would save his life, for what does it profit a man, for whoever is ashamed of me. Jesus is saying this cross will at least mean three things. One is death, there is loss, there is shame. Death, loss, and shame. We'll touch on that a little bit, uh, in, a, in a bit, but death, loss, and shame. I want you to remember that. Three things, death, loss, and shame. You know, when you take up the cross, if you really want to quickly apply this to ourselves, I, you must say, how, how does that apply to me? It means, it may mean lost opportunities for one. Lost opportunities that is in conflict with what the Bible is saying. 
If the Spirit of God has clarified in the Word of God about something and you're desirous for something, you might think that's a great job, that's a great uh, a knight in shining armor. I don't know who that, who or what that is. But you have to deny yourself. It could mean that if your pride is hurting, must acknowledge that that's something in the flesh. Where God is not glorified, it's time to deny yourself. You see, we think about uh, suffering of, of Christians in Syria and in all those places, and Jesus is saying, no, it's closer home, it's right here. There'll be death, there'll be death, there'll be loss, there'll be shame. And Jesus is saying, keep this cross handy. Keep it with you every day. Pick up the cross and keep it handy. And the moment there's a conflict between the spirit and the flesh, get on the cross. It should be the spirit always that wins as a conscious decision that you would take. The cross. What's a disciple then? What's a disciple? Again, we want to ask ourselves this question, what a disciple is not. One of the things that I understood, it's not about personality. It's not about natural personality. It's not about, you know, I'm easy to get along. Oh, he make a great disciple. It's not about I, you know, um, you know, I'm hospitable or whatever it is. Because that I know would disqualify me. I, I you know, I, I wouldn't fit that. But, I understand. It's not natural personality. It's also not outer piety. Charles Sheldon in 1896 in his book, In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do? It was a series of sermons that was compiled to be a book. And recently, you know, in some years now, people walk around with their brace, bracelets, WWJD. What would Jesus do? Imitating Christ. You know what the problem with that was? It wasn't intended for that. What happened is now you're trying on the outside to conform, to do what Jesus is trying to do with your strength on the outside. And that is not what discipleship is about. I want you to stay with me as I go through two more and then we'll look at the life of Peter and we'll understand this. So out of piety it is not. It's not about performance. It's not about out, of, you know, uh, out giving, out knowing, out learning. I was thinking that if somebody says, well, he knows the Bible or she knows the Bible more than someone else, would make a great disciple, but then Google should become a, the best Christian, right? <laughs> it's not performance. It's not production either. What do I mean by that? Because I know I, I'm guilty of that. I want to be active in the Lord's work. I want to do things. No, just fill up my time. And so I can tell people I'm, I'm busy in the work of the Lord. And I used to think that was something that I'd be able to show my Lord when I go up there and says, Lord, I'm here. That's my wagon of things that I did for you. And the Lord says, but where's the fruit? It's not production. It's not about what you can do. <coughs> Sorry, it's not what you have done, but what Christ has done in you. It's not the work. Galatians 5 is a great thing, right? Galatians 5 divides this two contrasts. The works of the flesh, the things that you would do, and the fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes we look at the fruit of the Spirit and we say, yeah, that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Not just take one, let's take self-control. Sometimes we can have self-control in the flesh because you will say, all right, the person said something, I'm going to control myself, I'm going to, you know, I won't do anything. And then one final day, I just blow up. I want you to understand that wasn't the flesh. It wasn't the fruit of the Spirit. John 15 verse 5 says, I'm the vine, 
you are the branches, whoever abides in me and I in him, he that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. There's a difference between bearing fruit and producing fruit. I as a branch abiding in the vine, it's the vine that produces the fruit and I bear the fruit so that others can see. I'm called to bear the fruit. But that's not what we saw, it's not about production. So, what then is a disciple? The word disciple means learner. Somebody who's learning. And that I think is a great understanding because you see in Matthew chapter 10 verse 25 it says, It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. 30 times in the book of Acts the word disciple is used and what, what that means is this. That long after Jesus left the earth, learning continued. The great commission is so that we would make disciples of Jesus Christ. That we make disciples. 2,000 years, the learning is still continuing. So if someone says that, hey, I've been a Christian for 20 years. My question to you, as you would ask for me, is what have you learned about the Lord today? We need to be learning. The, the interesting thing about this word disciple is Jesus didn't speak to his disciples in Greek. He spoke to them in Aramaic. And the word in Aramaic would be translated as an apprentice. I, I think that's a beautiful word picture because uh, you see how the world would do it is world would give you the theory, you study, you learn it, and then you come and test yourself and you, you know, you, you, they want to check to see whether you've learned or not. But an apprentice is hands on, you're learning. As the Lord says, learn of me, you know, he's there as he teaches you. And what he does is he gives you the test and through the test you learn. So as a disciple, this is, this is what I want to say to those who, you know, maybe going through a storm in the life or trials, difficulties, I'm not sure what. I want you to say, I want to say, take courage. It's the Lord who's teaching. You as his disciple. That you would learn more of his grace, more and more about, more about him as we as we said, more and more about Jesus, more and more about Jesus, more of the saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn, more of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. A disciple is one who recognizes that it's the inner transformation, it's not the outer conformity. And I learned this from the life of Peter. You see, if you look at the life of Peter, we see him in three phases. We see Peter in the gospel, an immature, impetuous Peter in the gospels. And then you see in the book of Acts, we see him as a growing Peter. And then as you get to the episodes, we see him as a mature Peter. You see, in the Gospels, what do we see? He wants to be the first. He's the natural leader. He's out there jumping at everything. He wants to answer first. He wants to be out of the boat first. There are two swords between 11 of them, and he had to have one of that. But what happens to him? As he says, you know, everybody will deny you, but I will not. His natural personality, his performance, his production was of no uh, consequence when he was tested. His strength failed, but thankfully not his faith because the Lord had said, I'm praying for you so that your faith fail not. But at that point of testing, he denied his Christ to save himself. That was Peter for us. But you, but you fast forward and get to the gospel, past the gospel to Acts. This is what we see. I want to read to you from Acts chapter 3, verse 14 to 15. Acts chapter 3, verse 14 to 15. This is after the miraculous, uh, uh, the miracle that happened when the lame man was healed 
but it gave beautiful. And this is by Solomon's portico. As people gather around and Peter gets up and he says this, he says, but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murder to be granted to you and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. Of this we are witnesses. I'm not sure if you caught that, but two things that gripped my attention is this. First he says, to the crowd there, he says, you denied the Holy One. And I, I would say, hey, listen, Peter, just a moment. Weren't you the one who denied three times? And Peter would say, yes. But I, could, I went to the cross and the Lord forgave me. Not just my sin, my denial, but also the guilt and the consequences. And today, I can stand here as a bold witness. A disciple who is growing becomes a bold witness not because of past experiences that shackle him or her but as a bold witness to Christ of the miraculous work that happens the inner transformation that happens in his life we ask ourselves is that happening there's another one where Later, we, we read about it in Galatians, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, but it's an event that happens in Acts. Remember the time when Peter was uh, uh, eating with the Gentiles, and then there were, there were these Jews who came from Jerusalem, and when they came, he separated himself, didn't eat with them. And Paul stood up to Peter and says, you sh what you're doing is wrong. And it says that, and he stood condemned. And I understand, you know, with the context there, but I don't see a defensive posture of Peter. He doesn't say, hey, well, who, who, who do you think you are? He just came in. I was with the Lord three years. I'm the older person here. He pulls no punch. He stands there in humility, recognizing that he did something wrong. Then you come to Peter in the episodes, and this is what we read in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises that, that these are the promises that enable you to share in his divine nature, enable you to share in your divine nature. Peter is saying, hey, look at me. I tried with my outer strength to do everything to please my God. Now I realize it doesn't work, but his promises is working in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. He is transforming me. And that I can have this participation in His divine nature. What does 1 John chapter 3 verse 2 says? When we see Him, we shall be like Him, for we shall know Him as He is known. A disciple who grows with that transformation, what he was today is not what he would be tomorrow. That's what we say, right? With the song that we sing each day, is sweeter than the day before. So a disciple is not one who wants to work everything in his own flesh, running in his natural self, but he's the one who trusts in the promises of God, deny himself, and depending on Christ. A disciple of Jesus Christ is one who's learned there's no place for his flesh. The flesh must be crucified. And Jesus says, follow me. Follow me. I think that's the crux of the whole thing, right? Any change you want is because of who you follow. Jesus in the gospel is called by five titles. Teacher, Rabbi, Rabboni, Master, and Lord. Rabboni is that... Uh, you know, means a great teacher. Uh, you know, it's just, that's what Mary calls him by, uh, by the tomb after resurrection. It's nowhere else is that word used. But I want you to look at this, Lord and Master. Lord and Master, you know, when, when we call our Lord, Lord and Master, it's not a title that he takes on, but he's a Lord by nature, he's a teacher by nature, he's a Master by nature, that's who he is. 
And we obey him because he is Lord and we learn from him because he's a teacher. We learn from him that he is Lord and we learn from him because he is Lord. Lord and teacher. But the question I ask myself is this, if he is the rabbi, he is the Lord and master, if he is the teacher, what's a subject? Right? You know, when you have a teacher, you have uh, physics, chemistry, biology. It could be your subjects. What's a subject of our Lord? He is the only grand king whose subject is himself. He teaches us about him. Isn't that a great invitation in Matthew chapter 11 verse 2? It says, those who are weary and heavy laden, take my yoke for, uh, and learn of me. Learn of me. What about those disciples to the road to Emmaus? As the two disciples were going on, Jesus uh, uh, get, comes close to them and says, what are you guys talking about? It, it's literally, this is what's written there. It says, and those, they just stand there. And it says, really? Like you ask me this question? You don't know what happened in Jerusalem? And they're sad. And this is what is written in Luke chapter 24, verse 27. And from beginning with Moses and the prophets in all the scriptures, he taught them concerning things himself, concerning himself. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The disciples continued that. When you read about Philip, as he spoke to the Ethiopian eunuch, this is what we read in, in Acts chapter 8 verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began in the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Uh, Peter ends his second episode with the same exhortation in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. And grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as a disciple, then we ask ourselves, what has been our soul desire? What is it that drives us? Do we want to really know more about it? I, I ask this question about the Garden of Eden, where, you know, the two trees that were there, right? One was the tree of life and the other was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But did you realize that there was only prohibition on that one tree? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Not on the tree of life. And yet, since the beginning, even as of today, men and women have reached out to get the fruit of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because it decides for themselves who, what choices they would make. They want to know, they want to say the things, uh, the, what, what, to do what, what our eye pleases. And yet as you come down to Revelation in 22, the only tree that is there is the, the tree of life. And I, I, I really sense that is heaven because at that point my desires are so because of him that there's no need for the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. There's no need for anything else because my choices are in him. He is my life and he is my choice. That would be something that we work and become each day that God gives us here. And then, um, you know, the time is up, but allow me just to explain very quickly about denying yourself. Because that's important, right? Because we sometimes think uh, denying yourself is about abstinence and asceticism. You know, uh, we deny ourselves, our flesh. We don't, we, we, don't uh, we, go, we fast, we do all of those. Everything is good. But hear what Colossians 2.23 says. Colossians 2.23 says, These are indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. What it means is you can on the outside try your best to deny yourself of the flesh, but all that will not prevent you from the desires of your flesh. 
the change must happen on the inside. The change must happen on the inside. So, really, denying yourself is spiritual. What that means is uh, when, when uh, Peter told Jesus, you know, rebuked him for saying that he's going to be, he's going to die, and the Lord says this, the Lord says, you know, set your mind on things about, not on the things of the flesh. And that's the idea here, right? We, 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 it's twofold. Our old self on the cross and, and Christ on the cross, uh, on, the, uh, on the throne, sorry. The self on the cross and Christ on the throne. These two must happen. And how does that really look practically? Just two very quick things and I'll, uh, I'll conclude. One is, remember when Peter was denying the Lord, he used this phrase, I know not that man. I want us to use that for ourselves, not for the Lord, but to say to myself, when my old nature prompts for attention and for pride or whatever, to be able to say, I know not that man, I know not that woman. So that I consciously direct my attention to what glorifies Christ. In Galatians 2.20, as Paul says, says, I've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is, being, it is to say that the prayer that the Lord taught his disciples that will be done would be true in my life. That's what a true disciple is. That thy will be done. Thy will be done. So, the question is this, there is a cost, there's a cost to follow Christ, it's not just lifting your hand up and saying I want, I, want, I want to be saved, discipleship has a cost, but it's a no brainer, his terms are far better than what this world can offer, his, his terms are ones that will be of eternal consequence. Disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ understand that they will be lost, there will be death, there will be loss, there will be shame. It's either here or later. Here when I deny Christ, when I deny myself and, uh, and crown Christ, there may be death, there may be shame, there may be loss. Or it may be when He comes in glory, the Son of Man comes in glory, the glory of the Father and the glory of the angels. So at each moment to be able to say that, that, that I will choose the glory of the Father. In, on April 10th, 1912, the Titanic set sail from Southampton, UK. And it had three classes on board. The first class, the second, and the third. The uh, Titanic passengers ranged from the rich and famous to the, uh, to the poor and obscure. Uh, but the, though the luxuries changed, even the third class had much better amenities than the other ship. But on the night of the 15th April 1912, the Titanic struck an iceberg 640 kilometers south of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, and that's where it sunk. And on the 19th of April, the Chronicle Herald of Nova Scotia carried this article. It says, the list of Canadians lost and the names of those saved. When Titanic started to sail, there were three classes. But in the final reckoning, there was only two, saved and lost. And Jesus is clear about this. There are only two camps. Saved and lost. And I, I plead and ask that those of us who have thought that we are in the camp where we are saved, 
very quickly, I wanted you to start looking at how your life is reflecting. Are there fruits of the work of Christ inside of you? Or was it something that you made and you think you're sealed forever? I believe in the eternal salvation, but I also believe that it starts to be increasingly evidenced as the work of Christ happens in your heart. And that is discipleship. Which can't be you. Father, we pray, Lord, in this short time, we, we pray, Lord, that, that your word will speak to us. We pray, Lord, that we will examine, test your faith, even as you have asked us to, Lord. Not to be, not to be complacent, not to just sit back and assume that we are in an all-inclusive, uh, all-paid-for cruise. But your word has been clear. The cost has to be paid. And these are your terms. And we pray therefore, Lord, that, uh, that, that we would be willing to take the death, the shame, the love, so that you will increase and that we will decrease. Thus we pray in your name and for your glory. Thank you. 